Good day, everyone. This is Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar. We are now beginning, uh, looks like, uh, week five um, of uh, Pathophysiology, Introductory Pathophysiology. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're, over, we're over the hump, over halfway through. And today I'm going to be talking about a negative feedback loop, or negative feedback loops in general, and, and we will talk about one specific um, looper mechanism. Of course, there are many. So, the reason that we're going to talk about negative feedback is, is the fact that a lot of uh, things that occur in the human body uh, are the result of negative feedback. It is a, one of the most common processes um, that occur, and so it does bear uh, discussing. So when we talk about negative feedback, well, what is it? Well, the simplest example of a negative feedback would be non-biological. And the simplest or the most intuitive example I can think of is uh, the following. You get in your car, you turn your car on, and a little buzzer goes off. And it continues to buzz or beep or ring or what have you. And you know that, ah, that's the fasten seatbelt alarm. And uh, you know that as soon as you fasten your seatbelt, the alarm turns off and you're no longer annoyed. That is a negative feedback loop. You get in the car, you have some feedback, or um, you uh, are uh, the car gives you a stimulus. Hey, you need to fasten your seatbelt, fasten your seatbelt, fasten your seatbelt. Oh, oh my God! And then as soon as you fasten your seatbelt, you you provide that feedback. Um, okay, my seatbelt's fastened. Don't don't annoy me anymore. And the buzzer goes off. That is a negative feedback loop. Um, many of these kinds of uh, loops occur. Um, in the body. One such a loop, or probably the, the most important uh, one that we'll, we'll talk about, is uh, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, the RAA system. Uh, it's kind of complicated. People have some confusion with it, and, and I hope that um, we can make some sense of it here today. Um, so let's talk about the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone cascade. Let's just go ahead and start at a kidney that, or a, <laughs> the kidney, at an organ we all know uh, fairly well, or should at this point, and this is a kidney. And I'll draw a little kidney here. And the kidney is used to a certain amount of pressure, a certain um, perfusion, a certain amount of blood going through it, a certain amount of pressure. I believe the kidney actually uh, takes about 20% of um, our cardiac output, or uh, total perfusion. Um, goes through the kidney. So the kidneys like blood. They like a lot of perfusion and they need that perfusion. Now, when the kidney detects that there is a decrease in perfusion, the kidney is rather unhappy. And uh, I like to think of the kidney as kind of a baby. The kidney's like a little baby, and what do babies do when they're unhappy? Well, babies cry. Well, the kidney does an analogous process, if you want to look at it that way, and the kidney cries. And it cries little tears of what are called renin. So it, cry, it cries tears, and I'm just going to put a big R here for renin. So the kidney cries tears of renin. Well, does renin by itself do much of anything? No, not really. It tells the body, though, hey, something's going on. The kidney's crying. It's not happy. The renin's letting the body know, oh, something's going on. So in response to this kidney being unhappy, the body goes, oh, we need to do something about this unhappy kidney. And what it does is it secretes angiotensin. And I'm going to put a big A here for angiotensin. And it secretes angiotensin 1. So I'm going to put a big A1 here. Well, angiotensin 1 doesn't do a whole heck of a lot by itself. But what happens is angiotensin 1 is secreted into the blood. It's a hormone. And eventually it end up, ends up going to where? Well, it goes to the lungs. And um, I'm going to try my, my best to draw uh, a little thoracic cavity and a trachea and a little heart in the middle. And uh, we have some lungs. Okay? So just use your imagination that uh, um, I've got my lungs here, my heart, um, my trachea my right and left main stem bronchus, and so on and so forth. So, angiotensin 1 goes to the lungs. In the lungs, there's an enzyme. The lungs secrete an enzyme known as ACE, ACE, or angiotensin-converting enzyme. 
angiotensin converting enzyme then transforms angiotensin 1 here into angiotensin 2. Now, does angiotensin 2 have some sort of action? Absolutely it does. Angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction, so it causes our vessels to constrict. Does that increase our blood pressure? Yes, it does. Can that potentially increase uh, perfusion to the kidney? Potentially. So we have, I'm going to just put a, put a big VASO for vasoconstriction. And it does one more thing. It causes another hormone called aldosterone to be secreted by the adrenal glands. So I'm just going to put a big ALD here. Aldosterone. And what does aldosterone do? Well, aldosterone causes us to hold on to salt sodium and water. So we hold on to water, we don't lose as much water, does that increase the volume circulating around in us? Yes. So ultimately what happens is I have vasoconstriction and I hold on to water. I don't secrete as much water. What does that do? Well hopefully that increases perfusion and when the perfusion increases sufficiently to where the kidney is happy the feedback comes to the kidney, and um, the kidney detects that, oh, okay, this is working, and then it quits crying because it's happy. No more renin secreted, which means that no more angiotensin 1 is, is secreted, which means there's no more angiotensin 2, which means there's no more aldosterone, which means that the vasoconstriction and the holding on to salt water can go away. That's the negative feedback. Until the kidney gets unhappy again, it starts crying. Then this cycle picks up, makes the kidney happy, the kidney stops crying, and the cycle stops. That is what it's meant by a negative feedback mechanism, is that once the kidney gets the feedback, ah, I've got perfusion now, it quits crying, it stops secreting renin, and this whole system stops until the kidney gets unhappy again, it cries renin, and then the system starts up. That is kind of the classic uh, renin-angiotensin-aldosterone um, uh, system. Uh, that is kind of a classic uh, negative feedback mechanism. Lots of mechanisms in our body are negative feedback. And that is to say that something is unhappy or something is wrong, and it lets the body know, hey, there's something wrong. And once the, um, the issue or the problem is corrected, uh, whatever tissue or organ what, that was crying will, will, will quit crying. Okay, I'm happy. And then all those mechanisms that went into making it happy go ahead and stop. And will they will restart uh, if that organ were to cry again. So that's how our body gets things done. And that's how our body kind of um, uh, communicates, if you will, through negative feedback. Uh, very similar to buckling your seatbelt, right? Once your car detects the feedback that you've buckled your seatbelt, it's happy and it no longer buzzes at you anymore. The, the very similar process that occurs uh, with the body here. Okay, so uh, just to go ahead and uh, wrap this up, there are actually some important things we need to know about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system for respiratory care. And one of them, uh, a couple of them relate to um, heart problems, something called congestive heart failure where the heart has been damaged or um, there's some sort of uh, pathological changes in the heart. Maybe there was a heart attack, some old damage, uh, some hypertrophy uh, of the muscle due to chronic hypertension, what have you. The heart's not working very well. Um, one of the medications that we see used for this heart failure or what's called congestive heart failure is an ACE inhibitor. It's actually a class of medications. Uh, lisinopril, for example, um, is an example of an ACE inhibitor. And the ACE inhibitor inhibits this enzyme, this angiotensin converting enzyme in the lungs, and it prevents angiotensin 1 from being converted to angiotensin 2. So the ACE inhibitor actually stalls this system out, if you will, and it prevents us from holding on to water and prevents vasoconstriction. Well, that's nice for patients that have chronic hypertension because that can help decrease the blood pressure. And it can also help them get, you know, diuresis water and so on and so forth. Now, a, um, 
A, so not only do we have blood pressure, but another condition that we use HACE inhibitors for is congestive heart failure. In fact, patients that have acute congestive heart failure or acute exacerbation that are not doing well, say they're in the emergency room, you may see them um, give IV ACE inhibitors to these patients. This is a somewhat of a newer modality that we're seeing now. Um, in addition to something called CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, that's actually something we'll do as respiratory therapists. I'm not going to talk about CPAP in a whole lot of detail uh, because you will actually um, have a formal, formal lectures and labs on CPAP and start using it um, later on in the course. But at least now you have a heads up that one of the major indications for CPAP is congestive heart failure. And one of the classes of medications that you'll see be given to patients with congestive heart failure are these ACE inhibitors. So not only are ACE inhibitors good for uh, blood pressure, for managing hypertension, they're also good for patients that have congestive heart failure. And you may also see ACE inhibitors used for patients that have heart attacks. Um, we're finding that using ACE inhibitor in somebody who has a heart attack may um, prevent what's called remodeling of the heart. And basically what that is, is when the heart is damaged, there are, um, a, there are cas there's a cascade of changes that occur. And some of those, the heart goes through what's called a remodeling process, and the cells in the heart change. And sometimes that remodeling is, is not good, and it can result in things like left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, and the muscle is not working, blood doesn't flow normally, and... and um, um, the, these, these changes prevent the heart from working uh, very efficiently. We're finding that if we can give ACE inhibitors to patients that, that are having have had heart attacks, we may be able to prevent some of that remodeling and what we call salvage um, some of the heart. Uh, obviously, there's going to be some damage with a heart attack, but we can help minimize uh, that damage by using ACE inhibitors. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and cut it off here. Uh, thanks for hanging in there.